Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network, coming to you from the TeacherCast studios since 2011. Join us each week as we bring you the latest educational news, ed tech updates, and hottest interviews with today's most influential leaders in education. And now, for your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello, and welcome to The Jeff Bradbury Show, a podcast from the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and in this episode, we're going to talk all about the status of education in today's global landscape, how AI is playing a role in shaping not only what's happening in the classrooms, but happening at the cabinet level of school districts, and also how we can change the culture of our school districts by controlling the things that are in front of us. I have a fantastic guest on the program today to talk all about these subjects and so much more. Don't forget to stick around to the end. We have a great show for you. We want to say one more time, thank you for joining us. There's a lot of great things that have been happening over on the Teacher Cast Educational Network. Our website has been revamped. We have a lot of new content. If you're looking to learn how to build your brand, your consultancy, and put a little bit of edu productivity to save you some time, we got a lot of great stuff happening over on the site. Head on over to buildyouredubrand.com. Check out how you can learn a little bit about email marketing, website development, SEO, and how you can save some time each and every week. We also want to welcome our instructional coaches onto the show today for listening. If you head on over to askthetechcoach.com, we have over 200 educational blog posts, all designed for educational coaches to find a job, keep their job, how to use data, how to better communicate with their staff, and also how to put together an instructional coaching program that is not only going to be effective for your students, teachers, but also for your community. And lastly, we want to invite anybody out there listening to join us on this program. We're here to feature amazing educators doing amazing things in and out of their classroom, and we would love to have you as a guest. Head on over to teachercast.net and fill out our contact form today. My guest today is an educator, thought leader, and CEO of Aspire Change EDU. I want to bring on today Mr. Eric Scheniger. Eric, welcome to TeacherCast. How are you doing, my friend? Jeff, always an honor, even though it's been a while. It's been a while. Chatting on TeacherCast. There's been so much stuff that's been happening since we last caught up here. We had an opportunity to reconnect at FETC. Uh, before we get into all the good stuff, how are you doing? What's going on with Eric these days? Oh my goodness. Well, you know what? Eric is constantly dabbling in AI. I'm telling you right now, I am just every time I'm just amazed at how it can not only save me time, but educators. So that's been keeping up. Uh, keeping me up at night in terms of just trying to find ways to streamline my consultancy, but also when I do one-on-one coaching and group coaching with teachers and leaders to try to um, help them work smarter, not harder. Also working on a new book. Uh, so excited to co-author a, a book that will be probably called uh, titled Personalize. And I- I'm writing it with a rock star principal, Nikki Slaw, who I've supported her school for the last two years and uh, just preparing for some trips overseas to uh, to work with schools in Dubai and the Northern Marianas Islands. So, uh, yeah, that's work's just keeping me busy. It's uh, it, I think it's an exciting time to really evaluate our practice and really think about those small changes that can lead to huge results. Well, let's talk about some of those huge changes. I mean, obviously, right now, you mentioned it. The the world right now is enamored with artificial intelligence. When we went to FETC, almost every other session that you could see was some kind of AI-based session. If I was to ask you, what is the current state of education from where you sit? Where would you say we are right now? Well, I think when you mentioned about all the sessions at FETC and, and all the tech conferences, I, I think we haven't really learned our lesson. We are chasing the next shiny thing, and that shiny thing is AI right now. And I think we have to take a, a breather. And you know, for me, I, I always refer back to Simon Sinek's golden circle. Why, how, what? So when I get to the what in terms of how AI can help build you know, better rubrics, personalized feedback, uh, interactive activities, it's 
knowing that when I get to the what, I've already covered the why and the how. So, so I think you know AI, just like any other tool, it's a tool. It's not going to radically transform the landscape per se. What is, is teachers, leaders, and other educators who continually look at their craft, think about things that they can do to grow, and then find that link to how AI can help them do what they're already doing better. So that's what I see in this landscape. You know, years ago it was VR, AR. Uh, come on, I remember when you know podcasting was the thing, and you were the only one doing it. And now they're all over the place. But teacher cast is my favorite, by the way. So you know, but but I think that we have to understand is behind the what we want to make sure there's substance behind it. So I think that's the the landscape today. I've had an opportunity over the last few weeks to have shows on this channel all about artificial intelligence. And, you know, you mentioned other things that have come out recently, AR, VR. I did a show the other day about, you know, technology that we no longer have. It was mentioned things like the cardboards of the world and all of that stuff. Do you feel that AI is one of those things that's going to be in the corner one day? Or are you in that camp of AI is that future? I think AI is going to usher in a new future. I'm not going to try to sit here and pretend that I know what that's going to be. Um, I do think it's going to continue to evolve. I look at AI as sort of an extension of the internet, which has not gone away. So I think we're going to have to grapple with a lot of disruptive change. Hey, and by the way, there's actually a book out there on that to help people navigate uh, the most disruptive force right now that is impacting education, which is AI. So uh, it's going to manifest itself into something different. But, but I do believe the more we understand and learn how we can leverage it in a purposeful, purposeful way now, to do things now is going to only be a, a greater asset as it, it continues to evolve. You know, I, I was thinking about this when we met the other day at FETC a few weeks ago. You and I first met in 2011. I was a baby in this world, not knowing what was going on. And I found this principle from just a few miles up their turnpike in New Jersey talking about this thing called social media. And you were sharing how social media is the next big thing and you can use it to tell your story. Don't be afraid. I believe they started calling you Principal Twitter and you were out on a mission that use social media to help a school district tell their own story. Is that where we are right now with AI? We're at the beginning, we're using it to tell our story. We're using it to be productive. Is there any similarities between where we were 10, 12 years ago with social media and where the world is starting to be right now with AI in schools? Yeah, it's it's an interesting take there, Jeff. You know, I, I see a lot of similarities, and I'm kind of glad you brought that up. You know, when we first got on social media, you know, we were like little kids that ran down and were waiting for our presents under the Christmas tree, or we couldn't wait for the tooth fairy to you know leave us some money. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's how we were with social media: the the the, the novelty, the the excitement, the unknown, the connection. I think AI is hitting those endorphins very in a similar fashion to social media. Whereas social media has now, I think it, it peaked and now it's on the downside, down the, the, down, the downside uh, side because you know uh, people, whether it's negativity or they don't see the value or overworked, or they might just be dabbling in AI. So I, I do feel that we're at this moment in time where we're going to kind of reap the same benefits. Uh, but like anything, it's, you know, do we understand where that balance is? Do we understand that it's not replace, it should never replace that humanistic element. It's not going to build those relationships. You know, we still have to make sure we facilitate you know, effective engaging lessons. We still need to make sure that, like social media didn't stop us from doing the work in our classrooms and our schools. It was a supporter and an enhancer. So I do think that if we're able to move past some of the mindset we have towards AI, it, it can really do what social media did for us in the form of personal learning networks uh, 13 years ago.
Well, 13 years ago, we were starting that conversation of should social media have a place in education? And we've seen, as you mentioned, that ebb and that flow where even, you know, every school district has an entire communications team now that's just on social telling that story. We went through the hump of should students be using their devices, their personal devices. And of course, now we've gone through one to one where I'm even seeing articles saying, should we be pulling phones from our schools, which you know, considering where we were 10 years ago, when you're having these consulting conversations with, with other thought leaders, with other consultants, with other school districts and other countries, where do you see this saturation happening with AI? There are school districts out there, just like with social media, just like with devices saying, this is bad. There's some saying we're going to look around and there's some saying foot on the gas. Here we go. What does the world think in your opinion? of AI in the classrooms and in the corporate rooms. Yeah, I'm going to kind of go back to what you said about, you know, devices. You know, devices there was a knee jerk reaction by most to just ban them, block them, let's get rid of it. And what that resulted in was a school culture that looked and felt nothing like the real world. And what the device really did was it was disruptive force that should have acted in a way to get us to take that critical lens of our practice and think about, okay, how might we be able to get more students involved during the direct instruction component? How might we be able to collect form of assessment uh, data so that we could use it to really determine if our lessons are effective and support those kids that needed it? You know, how can we create more engaging uh, activity. So I, I think the same thing with AI, but looking at differently, AI is putting us in a position as educators to really ask, are our assessments good? You know, are we, you know, asking the right questions? Are we designing, you know, tasks where kids are, you know, have to solve real world problems that might have more than one solution? So I, I think AI, I look at it as a kind of a le level setter where it, it's really getting us to look at the practices that have been entrenched in pre-K through 12 for hundreds of years. And now is the time AI is saying, hey, let's look to improve our practice. And I hope that's the result. But if we block and ban it in the school, Great. Okay. Well, we're not teaching our kids about digital responsibility. We're not teaching them how to leverage it in ways to save time. We're not allowing educators to use it to do a myriad of things that could save countless time. But then what's going to happen? Kids can still go and use it outside of school or just like they have even in early days of internet and technology devices, kids will find the workaround in school. Looking through your website, ericscheniger.com, one of the things that popped out was you call yourself a digital pioneer. I'm curious, and this is something I, I don't have the answer to, how did you get into education? Yeah, well, the digital pioneer was kind of given to me by my website designer, and I kind of just <laughs> stay there, so I can't say. I, I, I mean, I, I think for me, I was more of a pioneer in terms of getting lucky and doing things before other people. Now, what separates, I guess, what happened with me and others was that we were able to show efficacy in our work. So, but but the irony of all this is that I, you know, had the fixed mindset, didn't believe in any of this. I was the person that wrote the, I would have been the person blocking AI right now, you know, because I was the person that blocked social media, banned devices, and, you know, when we change, we change when we see the value in things or we become uncomfortable. So uncomfortable to the point that we question the very fabric of why we do things. How might we do it better? What tells if we're successful? So when a student told me school was like a jail, when I chased into my building and took my device, that was a state of great uh, discomfort. And then we talked about social media. I just happened to get on social media before many other people, two years before you. And uh, I mean, other people are on it, but you know, social media helped me see the value in doing things, not just differently, but doing things better. And I always tell people, when I hear people up on stage saying, this is new, this is new, AI is new, yeah. But scaffolding questions and tasks, building better assessments, 
uh, providing you know practical, timely feedback, using high effect strategies, not new. We didn't do anything that was new per se. We just leveraged those sort of catalysts, the catalyst of discomfort and the catalyst of value to really question our practice and then collectively make the move to incremental shifts that ultimately radically transformed our culture while improving achievement. One of the things that I know about you is you have been very successful in not only creating, but changing the culture of where you are, right? I mean, take back to where you were the principal of the high school in New Jersey. You created a culture where these things were okay. These things were safe. I'm sure there was professional development. There was, there was an idea of this is where the future is. Let's go there. You mentioned the puck earlier. What advice can you give to educational leaders today of how do you not only set a vision but get everybody around you to change the culture so that way everyone's on that same page moving forward. So first off, uh, one person doesn't change culture. I did not change culture. I gave people permission to reflect on their practice. I removed the excuses. We tackled the resistance. So when I think about culture, it's because my teachers saw the value in doing things better. They embraced, they didn't, we, we didn't use buy-in. So, you know, as leaders, if you're looking to sell a better way to do things, go read Dan Pink's drive. And if you're doing those carrots and sticks, if then rewards, it's not going to stick. You got to find out though, you kind of got to look at it from a lens that, you know what, Rome wasn't built in a day. Change is a process. It's not an event. So if you really want to create a culture, you have to understand that the most in instrumental component of a positive culture are your teachers, your support staff, your students. So it, it begins with asking the right questions. Questions are more important than answers. But then really looking at not change for the sake of change. What does the evidence tell you? What does the research lead you to? People always say to, to me, uh, you know, uh, teachers will be like, Eric, we know the why. We want to know how do we do it and what can it look like? So as leaders, yes, you want to establish a shared vision. You want to build consensus. You want to provide support, feedback, professional learning that is truly personalized. You want to look at you know, how you communicate effectively. You know, I think as leaders, you got to look at your role as a Swiss Army knife. There is not one best way to lead. There is not one best practice. There are effective practices. And when it comes down to leadership, you got to determine that, hey, what is the most effective way to lead based on this challenge or this opportunity or this data point? And then leadership is about the collective. You know, when we think about the most effective leaders, they can say, I don't know and I need help. And there's no shame in that, everybody. How have you been successful through this? How did you learn this? How did you pick this up? Was it trial and error? What was that journey like for you over the last 15 years? Well, I think success is all in the eye of the beholder. And I think if people look at my trajectory as one of success, then I need to educate them on all the failures and mishaps along the way. And I think failure is the best teacher if we look at it that way. Uh, I used to think that, hey, I got to be perfect. I, I got to do everything right. No, uh, there is no perfection education. I cannot be perfect for my staff. I can't be perfect for the districts and schools that, that I support. But what I can do is work to grow every day. And I think we need to chase growth, not perfection. Whether it's AI, building better assessments, personalizing the learning experience, developing not common planning, but high functioning PLCs, uh, I, I think we have to look at there's always an opportunity to get better, no matter what the data is telling us, no matter if our communities are satisfied. So for me, the failures have helped be stepping stones to growth. 
And, you know, people could say, well, Eric, you know, look at your bio, you won lots of awards. I won awards going back to culture. I won awards because my teachers believed that they could be better. My teachers did the work and I got the bask in their glory. So, you know, I, I think we always have to look at short-term and long-term goals and, and really think about, hey, what can I control? Because too often we focus on things that are beyond our control. What can I control right here and now? And what do I want to be able to do for my school, uh, my staff, my district, or the people I support in the next couple of years and continually set achievable goals that we can show that efficacy towards. So that's my long-winded answer at just thinking that, you know, success is, uh, it's kind of like the iceberg analogy. You know, you might see success above the surface. That's just the tip. But below are all the things, the feedback, the trial, the error, the, the anguish, the, the the sleepless nights, uh, all the books we read, uh, all the people we connected with, so on and so forth. It seems so easy, right? You 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 bask in the glory of those around you. I, I had a conversation earlier with an educational leader, and the question was, how can you move the needle if those who are in those decision-making positions aren't what we used to call connected educators, right? And, and in that conversation, we were saying, you know, if only I could get a superintendent to go to an ISTE conference or go to an ASCD conference or go, go meet this wonderful consultant and friend of mine over here. How do you start to move the needle when those who are in those decision-making positions don't have their head above the water and they're only under the water? Um, well, the short answer is you give them a copy of disruptive thinking in our classrooms um, or, you know, I, I think that it's, you know, and I get that from teachers a lot is Eric, how can I lead the change? You know, because of what you just said, and, and this is what I always say, again, you can only control what you can control is show efficacy in the work use, you know, not use your students, but, you know, show the work through the lens of your students and how it impacts them. Um, you know, I remember, and you remember, uh, do you remember my Dynamo teacher librarian? Do you remember her name? I can see the face right now, but it was so long ago. I don't remember the name. So her name was Laura Fleming. Yes. And Laura did all this stuff, maker spaces before everyone else, micro credentials way before digital promise and everybody else. And I remember when everyone thought it was playtime, a lot of our teachers and she was patient she, you know, powered through some of the negativity and then got most of the staff wanting to collaborate with her. But in terms of changing minds, her work began to resonate with students and staff and the community alike. And I remember her telling me the story of two students that went to the board meeting shortly after I'd left New Milford High School. And those two students basically said, we didn't feel anyone believed in us. School wasn't working. We were going to drop out until Miss Fleming. And she brought the board and central office to tears. And that then became a catalyst for an immense amount of funding to totally transform the library space. So I always say that leadership is not about title, position, or power. Leadership is about action. How do our actions help to educate, empower, inspire those who are in positions of power, because often they don't know what they don't know. And it's incumbent upon us to, you know, focus on the what ifs instead of the yeah buts in order to help to open their eyes and minds like mine was uh, to what's possible. Will it always work? No, it won't. But there's two now flat with AI. We can find the peer reviewed research. You know, we can search blogs. You know, one thing I love doing is sharing, you know, what schools are doing, not just to support the schools that I am blessed to work with, but so others can see what's possible and they can use the work from a practical lens in their conversations to help move change forward.
So if one was reading a wonderful book called Disruptive Thinking and happened to be on page 169, you'd be talking about thinking beyond the grades, essentially. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because we, we, we're we made, we're like Pavlov's dogs, you know, when Pavlov did the experiment, rang the bell, and even when there's no food, the dog salivated. That's how we are with grading, homework, zeros. We still sustain practices because that's what we experienced. But you want to know something? You know, what does a grade really mean? Does it actually reflect learning? Right. Uh, and there's a school in Utah, Quest Junior High School. Uh, and their principal is the one that I'm co authoring the next book on. They got rid of grades, they got rid of points, hmm. they got rid of the game of school, and they use rubrics for everything. And they are one of the highest achieving junior high schools in the state of Utah. And I'm t- telling you, like top 5%. It can be done, Jeff. Everything that we think about or we think is too challenging or won't work, it either, it, it's either has or is being done right now. It just takes bold leadership to really think about maybe it's not getting rid of grades, but maybe it's do we make grades more reflective of learning? And that's what we did at New Milford High School. But you just said control only what you can control. So if I, as a teacher, say tomorrow, I'm going to forget grades and we're just going to have this rubric system, I can't affect the rest of the world. I'm still bound by the rules that my uppers have given to me. How can a teacher create change if they are, you know, they only can control what they can control and they can control only what's, you know, in that classroom? How do you do that? Yeah, I think you start with some incremental steps. And I think that one step could be just designing more effective rubrics that that give students uh, more context for the grade that they're being assigned. And, and maybe you start with that. You know, I, I often see a, a great deal of opportunities for growth in moving from arbitrary, random point scoring guides Two, well-designed rubrics that actually give students context and show them where they are at in their learning trajectory and where they could be. Um, I, I think that changing grading in a classroom, it's radical. And I think that something like that, depending on the state that you are in, you're going to have to lay the groundwork to kind of advocate for this approach. So doing you know doing a research review showing examples where it's working and and run like a pilot with with one maybe one class not all of them that's where i'd start because you want to be able to show efficacy in that work before just going through full throttle in my opinion you know i'm curious we started at the beginning of this conversation talking about the state of education and where you see the world i know you have the opportunity to not only work in the united states but elsewhere when you work abroad are those schools, organizations, are they asking you for the same types of topics? Are they asking you the same questions? Where do you see this country as opposed to the other countries, like you said, Dubai, that you have a chance to work at? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, when I am fortunate to have, fortunate enough to do work abroad, you know, there's a lot of similarities. You know, maybe it's different curriculum, maybe it's different standards. But the, 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 you know, the focus areas are the same. You know, there's a great deal of emphasis on, hey, let's really work to bump up level of thinking. You know, DOK, Blooms, uh, again, that's sort of something that is uh, an area of emphasis everywhere. You know, how do we personalize learning? When I go to Dubai in May, a lot of the work is going to be coaching leaders and working with their staff on how do you effectively personalize uh, whether it's rotational models, choice activities, playlists, flipped lessons, you know, what's the role of data? Also, uh, another common thread is is just feedback. You know, how do we create these robust learning walk protocols where we're able to provide that non-evaluative feedback to help teachers and leaders grow? So, could be different parts of the world, different time zones, different weather, but again, we are all teaching kids. And every system is looking for the most effective ways to do what they're already doing better. Talking today to Eric Scheniger, you can find out more information about him over at ericscheniger.com. And Eric, I want to end with the question that I like to ask you on this program. When you and I have a conversation on this podcast this time next year, 
What do you think we're going to be talking about? <laughs> I think we're going to be talking about how AI has just become like the new backpack, the new pencil in terms of a support of education. I think we're also going to be looking at advances in, you know, uh, tutoring technology and possibly, you know, AI enhanced robotics that can really help to, uh, you know, assist. And I think that we're going to start seeing that. I really thought that holograms were going to take off. Um, I, I saw that it was creepy on New Year's Eve a few years ago, and there was a hologram. I really thought that was going to take off in terms of, you know, a, a better way to kind of facilitate professional learning and bringing guest speakers and stuff. But that kind of just has fizzled. So uh, I don't know what that's at, but I, I think AI is still going to be there, and I, and I think that hopefully we're going to be having different conversations about the role of school. Uh, I hope we can more, go more competency based, seat time, Carnegie units, all that. But we'll see. C could you expand a little bit on that tutoring comment? I'm curious. I, I think that AI is going to re revolutionize how we can provide tutoring service for students. You know where it can analyze. You know whether it's SAT, standardized test scores. You know, find you know, do an item analysis, find those gaps in terms of you know the. the uh, standards or concepts that students are struggling with. So I really think there's going to be advances in that. And that will be uh, the tutoring industry, in my opinion, if I have a crystal ball, we're going to see a boom in that area in terms of AI enhanced tutoring. Uh, that's my bold prediction. Nice. That's interesting there. Um, Eric, where would somebody reach out and uh, find you on social media if they're looking to say hi? Well, I'm I'm in every space, even TikTok, even though nobody likes and follows my TikToks, and I just have not mastered that tool. But you put in Eric Scheninger, I will come up. But as you mentioned before, ericscheninger.com, that's my landing page, where you can see all the things that uh, my team and I are doing to help support schools. Certainly check that out. All the links that we've been talking about today are going to be over in our show notes. So don't forget to head on over to teachercast.net. Check that out today. You can find this and the first podcast that Eric was on. I believe I was thinking about this earlier. I think you were on show number six or seven. Wow. A long time ago. Talk about being an OG. And again, I just want to say on record, Eric, thank you for being a supporter. You were one of those guys that when I first was starting out and I didn't really have a name or I didn't even have a microphone at that time. You took a chance and said, sure, I'll be on this guy's podcast. He's from New Jersey. Why not? So thank you so much for all the support over almost 13 years. My pleasure, Jeff. And I think that's an important point is we always have to understand, you know, our roots and pay it forward every chance we get, because that's what we want our learners to be able to do. And we want to say thank you guys for not only supporting TeacherCast for the last 13 years, but checking out this podcast and everything. Again, head on over to TeacherCast. We've got a lot of great stuff. If you're looking for educational leadership, we got some great stuff over there. If you're looking to build your EDU brand, we've got a lot of great productivity tips. Of course, our Ask the Tech Coach channel is always going on uh, smoothly. And if you're looking to make educational podcasts in your studio or with your students, we've got a lot of great content for that too. And that wraps up this episode of the Jeff Bradbury Show. On behalf of Eric and everybody here on TeacherCast, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to the TeacherCast Educational Network hosted by Jeff Bradbury. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at TeacherCast or online at www.teachercast.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.